Welcome, everyone. And thank you very much for joining us today for the future of mobile service and the future of mobile service cloud. I, I can really appreciate that everyone trekked through the rain. How many of you came from the main keynote today? <laughs> Nearly everyone. Thank you so much. I'm delighted that you decided to join us. We have an incredible set of experiences for you over the next hour, and I can't wait to share those with you. But before I get started, I wanted to remind everyone that the Service Cloud keynote is tomorrow morning at 10.30 a.m., Moscone South. Uh, Alex Bard will be sharing his journey and our customer's journey uh, through a number of success stories, and they're going to be giving away an iPad mini to boot, so don't miss that one. Now, I'm sure everyone has seen this statement a lot <laughs> at Dreamforce and probably elsewhere, but this is profoundly more important for this session because nearly everything that you see today is going to be the future. And I'm not just talking about the next release, I'm talking about the next 10 to 20 years. So please make any purchase decisions based on currently available product. Now my name is Scott Beechuk, Senior Director of Product Management for the Service Cloud at Salesforce. But this isn't really about me, this is about you, and this is about my next guest. Now, this man, has been known as a visionary. He's been known as an Imagineer. And Wired Magazine called him the most connected human being on the planet Earth. I am very proud to introduce my good friend, Chris Dancy. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> so I'm actually doing something cool this session. I, I normally. Uh, uh, share my vital information on the screens, but I actually have a new uh, sensor that is actually measuring my posture. So actually when I start to slump over, uh, you'll see that I'm slouching. So we'll actually have real-time feedback on how badly I'm communicating to you, which is always more exciting than most. Um, I am so excited to be here, as every speaker says, but I really am, and I have the heart rate to prove it. Uh, <laughs> You know, the future of mobile service, we need to really, for me to be able to explain this in ways that make sense to me, I need to really kind of go back through my own career. Because without a little bit of reflection, it's really impossible to gauge the future. Because you're just guessing. Right? The future is nothing more than a bunch of guesses that people thought about and then put together and said, this is what's going to happen. So in 1993, this is me working at my desk, that's a, that's a handsome young man there using a, what we called a dumb terminal, what we now today call who knows what, uh, talking to an AS400, and that little pink slip was the ticket that customers would leave for me. That's how they would interact with me. They would say, hey, here's your ticket. I'd come back from lunch, it'd be a stack of them. You know, by 1995, I was terrorized by the color pink and paper. It just it didn't work. But, but as a customer service agent, this is all I had, and this is all of our customers had. By 1996, things were getting better in my world. I could actually go to lunch and while I was away at lunch, not come back to a pile of paper, but an inbox full of email, really poorly formatted email, basically telling me all the things that went wrong. And this was probably not the best for our customers and probably not the best for me, but it was the best we had. And 1996 wasn't that long ago. How many of you were working in 1996? I mean, this is what we had, all right? I mean, this is the best we could do. You'd, by 2003, things were radically different because we had IIS-4. Anybody install IIS-4? Uh, and you could actually put an intranet in your company. And the intranet allowed your employees to connect to your computers and, and share websites. And you had the rise of SharePoint. And our tickets went from really text-based ticketing to these forms. And the interesting thing about form-based workflow is it forces your customers through your process. Think about that. When you fill out a form, you're not doing things your way. You're doing things the organization's way. It's like Burger King for IT, right? Yeah, you'll get a lot of those. I'm very tweetable. So form-based workflow does not work for customer service, but it's the best we had, right? So this whole presentation is about what we had and what we're going to have. By 2007, it became profoundly easier because we could put cute icons on the web form. 
and you had animated GIFs and all sorts of things, and it became personalized. I could put in all sorts of information. But again, adding cute icons to a web form just doesn't make sense. It's, it's a web form. It, you can, it's on the internet. It's connected to the, all the information in the world. It should be more powerful. Which leads me to my first point that I discovered as a professional. Just because you can make software doesn't mean you should. Stop. If it's not helping someone, you're wasting everyone's time. Well, it's a good career, but it's not helping. We've got a history we just went through that shows this. So by 2009, we really got into this whole kind of social, right? Let's, let's be very collaborative. And I, I call this open self-service. Uh, this is actually a screenshot of uh, Get Satisfaction, Wendy Lee, their CEO, wonderful lady, Wendy. Uh, but this is great, because you can actually go to it, you can report a problem, and your peers can chime in on it, or what we call today Twitter. Um, and you can crowdsource the answer, and you can report uh, all sorts of outages. What I like about open self-service is, if you notice, you can ask a question, report a problem, but you can also give praise. Do you ever notice when you go to a customer service portal, it's nothing but a reflection of every problem you've ever had? Can you imagine if your mother kept a baby book of all the times she was angry at you? Right? Where's the customer service portal that says, hey, you did a good job? And that's one of the options. Right? Now that's a separate process. Once again, making people do your process. When you interact with tech, you want to do your process. That's what this is about. By 2010, we had activity feeds. The activity feed was going to save us. And Mark Benioff earlier this year said he feels in the future all workflow will be done through an activity feed. And I believe him. I think the activity feed is robust, it's dynamic, it's interactive, it's searchable. It's, it's personalized. You get feedback from it. Uh, activity feeds are the dopamine for web forms, right? So this is the way we should actually work with information. Which kind of leads us to what happened in 2010. Shoving a web form on a tablet is like strapping rockets to a donkey, right? Why would you take a tablet which has more sensors than the, the most space vehicles and put a web form on it other than to frustrate people? First, it's got no keyboard. Uh, second, you, you tilt it or touch it or touch the home button and you lose everything, right? I, why don't we just, you know, just terrorize customers by wearing Halloween costumes, right? This is, this is not the way that this sort of thing should work. So as a point of reference, some of you are here. And we're going to be talking about mobile self-service and kind of the way I think it should be. The important takeaway is, the software you develop, if you're a developer, should be as smart as the device it's running on. It's a very simple paradigm. It worked in mainframes. It worked in PCs. We got to mobile phones and tablets, and we never even talked about connected devices. And we stopped. The devices got smarter than our ability to interact with them. Why? Did we give up? Are we not as good as the devices? I think not. Which leads us to this major paradigm shift we face in 2013. If you objectify and fetishize the customer experience enough, you believe your customers are interacting with this lady. But this lady is a stock photo. She doesn't exist. She doesn't answer phones. She's a model. She's not real. Or, you could build the most profoundly technologically advanced piece of software ever that interchanges the customer interaction. Both kind of leave you to this crossroads. Do you fetishize this human element? Do you build really powerful technology? Or do you find some equanimity between the two? Today we face, I think, one of the greatest crises in human history when it comes to social interaction since probably the introduction of electricity. We've taken our relationship to machines and we've turned it into something profoundly different. If I go to the grocery store, people are waiting in line for self-service. And there's a free checkout person. If I go to the ATM where I live in Denver, there are people waiting in line for the ATM. Two lines for the teller are open. We don't want to deal with people. 
Now, that's not saying we believe people are bad. What we want to deal with are sets of information that are repeatable and enjoyable. If I called customer service and it was horrendous every time, I wouldn't mind. The problem is, it's not. Sometimes it's good. The anxiety provoked by picking up the phone and not knowing whether it's going to terrorize me or make me happy makes me want to wait for a machine. Machines are consistently adequate. Humans are consistently human. And we need to design for human information interaction, not human computer interaction. Because humans interact with information. They do not interact with computers. And this has led to some really interesting developments. I, there's a video up there of a sign spinner telling people to come in to a pizza shop, right? You know, this whole idea that robots are taking our jobs. Uh, down there, you've got a picture of a, a, a machine that for, for $20 will pet, pet your cat. Uh, if you're paying $20 for a machine to pet your cat, you deserve neither. <laughs> right? So how we look at what machines we allow them to do in our lives changes our perception of this. I was probably most moved by this juxtaposition recently when I was in San Francisco, and I ordered for something from Amazon, the panacea of all things cool, right? One-click ordering. It's so amazing when you think about it. We, we buy things with invisible money, and we buy invisible things, and then they get invisibly delivered to us. It's like we buy nothing with nothing to create nothing to share it to somebody who doesn't pay attention. Like this crazy, this crazy transaction that we're in. But what I did was I went to Amazon and I actually needed a, a case. I think it was for my eyeglasses because I don't want to get them crushed. So I ordered it and it said, do you want this delivered locally? So I said, sure. And then all of a sudden, I got a text message saying, Bailey has your package and you can go pick it up. And I thought, Bailey? Who's Bailey? And there was a link to a map. So I clicked on it and I walked to an Amazon locker where their Bailey was waiting for me. They're each named uniquely. Again, we're naming machines and creating some sort of weird fetish here. And that's me pulling my package out. I probably won't say that on stage another time. Um, and, then, <laughs> and then you literally grab the box and, and Bailey thanks you. And as you walk away, because of the proximity detection, she knows you're gone and you get a little message, how was your experience with Bailey? This is really profoundly different because I went to the web and ordered something and then it was ready an hour later in a 7-Eleven in a locker that my phone walked me to. And if you're in customer support, we have to really think about what this looks like when it comes to AI or artificial intelligence. So let's look at what IBM is doing with artificial intelligence real quick in under one minute. When IBM Watson beat the best Jeopardy! champions in the world, that was just the beginning. Well, a great example is IBM helping organizations to use Watson to interact with their customers. Last year, there were over 261 billion calls made on call centers and one out of two calls went unresolved. A new generation of consumers has a far greater set of expectations of what they want from their companies and brands they interact with. Watson's transformative technology has the ability to completely change how this interaction takes place. To be able to answer questions and to engage the customer in a dialogue that establishes trust, that's what we're really trying to enable here, forming that relationship with the customer. Watson is coming in at the right time as a technology to help improve client engagement, both in a self-service as well as an agent-assisted model. So that's like so cool. So Watson won Jeopardy, and then he took my job at the call center, right? So I could stay home and like have be doubly, you know, insulted. Um, but this leads us again at a crossroads, right? Where do we consider? the future of work, and where do we allow data and AI to pick up? And, and I think this is going to become very clear toward uh, my presentation's uh, finale when I talk to you about how I see this all coming to play. We really live in the age of assisted opinion. Um, most of us have friends, but most of our friends are in a device. Uh, I have a friend named Donna. She has a 14-year-old who's been on Xbox for six years. His neighbor is leaving Xbox to go to PlayStation because his parents don't want to pay the fee. He's never met this young man, so Donna's actually paying the fee to keep him on Xbox so he doesn't move away. 
She's paying the fee to the other family so her child's friend that he's never met doesn't move away. So everything we need is in our devices. At night, I feed it and put it to sleep. If it makes a noise, I pick it up and I touch it, right? This is very, very, very deep human emotions tied to this. Everything I need to know is in here. It's like a mirror. This is Narcissus, right? So how do we develop to feed people's minds to create for them an equanimity in customer support within their lives? We do this first by allowing the, the devices to be as smart as the software they run on. A great example of this is Apple just introduced location applications near me. So instead of looking at just the five-star rated applications, you can say, hey, what are the applications in this room? By the way, it's really funny sometimes to do this, especially at like giant organizations that go, okay, I know what your people are using, right? Because <laughs> it scans everybody's applications, which can be awkward. Um, but it can also be helpful, because if you're in some place new, like a theme park, you might want to know what other people are using in that theme park. You know, for me at my company, we created something called My IT, um, because I really felt that for IT support, I should have something that assisted me that was a relationship to the world around me. I didn't want to create tickets. I wanted to be informed. I didn't want to ask for services. I wanted to be empowered. So building applications that allow us to do these things is very simple. We just need to be very careful with what and how we use the information and present it to the user. Obviously today, with all the excitement from the keynote around Salesforce One, Salesforce has embraced this. Salesforce One platform is a platform for mobile information exchanges. It is a platform to innovate and allow people to create applications as dynamic as their customers. But more importantly, you're not forcing someone through your process, you're allowing them to dictate their own. You should have that freedom. Your customers should have that freedom. But in 2013, our devices are even more powerful. This is a, this is a Moto X. Uh, I, I'm not just an iOS guy. Uh, and what I love about Moto X is it's always listening, unlike my spouse. So if I say to it, OK, Google now, it says, hi, Chris, can I help you? It's like the NSA, but personal. <laughs> you can tweet that. Um, <laughs> The iPhone 4, or 5S, right? It's got the sensor on it, right? So it knows when you're talking to it. Uh, the Samsung Galaxy S4, it knows the temperature and humidity in the room. Imagine creating a, a customer feedback application that told you how hard they were squeezing the phone when they were talking to you. By the way, that's a survey. Filling out little check boxes on how much you didn't like something isn't. If someone's squeezing the phone while they're talking to you and the sensors can pick up the heat in their hands, that's a survey. But what do we could do? And of course, Google Glass, right? The new kind of thing. You've got all these kind of play on words. People make, I won't even say the, the term that people use for it, but it's nice. I used to have to look down. If I need information now, I can just look up, right? Okay, Google, where's Dreamforce happening? And it's just hanging there in front of me, right? That's just the way this information should work. So moving forward, we need to really look at where this innovation is going to come from and how is representatives in technology building services need to, to have a relationship with this. And for me, I think the first clue, if you want to be on the cutting edge, watch Pretail. Pretail is where all these devices are getting created. All these sensors and all these neat use cases are happening on Kickstarter. Kickstarter should be your homepage because the stuff that's happening on Kickstarter will be mainstream in six months. Just right now, it's odd and kooky. right? Next, and before we move on, this is an issue that's very, very personal to me. How many of you have noticed this, this media attention toward digital detoxes? Put your devices down. Right? You even see restaurants. If you, you get 15% off a tip if you leave your cell phone up front. Um, you've got people who, uh, like Paul up there, he actually went offline for a year and documented his life. Can you imagine in 1995 if someone was paid to not watch television for a year and write about it, right? So this concept of digital dualism is really important to talk about and it's really important to think about for your customers and for your families and for your lives. 
Because if you're more concerned about someone using technology in your presence, you're the one with the attention problem. If you're so concerned that someone's not paying attention to you by using their phone, you've got the attention problem. So let's be kind. Let's leave here today and be kind. Let's be kind to each other. Enough of that rant. So we're at a crossroads. We don't understand the power we have. We certainly don't know how to use it. And we're objectifying each other for using it the ways that we find possible, the ways that we find most profound. What do we do? What do we do? Well, for me, I think the answer is going to be found in wearable computing. Right now, I'm wearing 11 sensors. Boom, 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 right? I won't even go into all of them. But they're monitoring everything I'm doing. When I'm home, they allow me to have an assisted reality. So these are all the sensors that are on my body and in my home. At any given time, there are three to 400 systems collecting everything I do. I'm not doing anything but living, by the way. They're collecting the information. And what are they doing with the information? They're creating an experience for me. They're turning the lights a different color if it's raining outside. If I didn't get a good night's sleep, they're adjusting the humidity. If the dogs have been too lazy, they're making the music turn on and blare and make Rocco jump off the couch. By the way, this is Rocco, right? So what do we do now that we can actually use everything around us to create experiences for customers? I think there are some profound examples of this happening as we speak today. So if you go to Disneyland, when I went to Disneyland, I was excited to get the hat with my name scrolled on the back, because it's like that Starbucks coffee. There's my name, you know, except it's on a hat. Disney has something called the Magic Band. The Magic Band works in conjunction with the application on the phone to therefore make your park experience more enjoyable. I think this is really interesting, because you could actually use the Magic Band and some biofeedback to adjust rides in real time. You had a pretty boring experience so far? Turn the ride up a little bit, right? It's not that it's impossible, and it's not that it's from the future. It's now. Disney's doing it. If Walt Disney thinks it's safe, it's safe. <laughs> Disney, you know, poison apples and, and magic bands. I mean, come on, he's got, he's got it covered. Next to that, you've got a, a disposable sensor. I think these are amazing. A lot of families can't afford to go to the movies on the weekends. You know, uh, $60 for four people to see a movie is crazy. But with an anonymous disposable sensor, like a Band-Aid, you'd slap it on your kids, you'd get to the movie, see the movie for free, you'd throw the, the sensor away on the, out, on the way out like you do with 3D glasses, and that sensor's information could be used to sync to the movie, and movies could be edited in real time. It makes a lot of sense. You get a free movie, they get information about the movie, it's anonymous, everybody's happy. Some people say, oh, but that's a surveillance state. It's anonymous. Don't tell me you're worried about a surveillance state when your key ring is full of discount cards. You don't care about a surveillance state. You care about 10% off. You should live in Walmart, not real life. Yeah, that's harsh. But this type of wearable is even scarier. So in Japan now, they've got fully consumerized exoskeletons. Can you imagine? Your kid coming home and saying, I'd like an exoskeleton to wear to school, right? And he's crushing things, and he's like lifting up the house, and you know, it's like bam, bam, gone bad from the Flintstones, right? I just think we need to be profoundly careful with the way that we interact with how we perceive technology and what we allow it to do in our lives, which leads us to this choice, right? Do we look at wearable computing and say, oh, it's so bad, it's, I'm, I'm really afraid, it can't be good. Or do we say, hmm, there's a way that we could use the information from wearable computing. There's a way that we can use the information we collect around us in a positive way. And that's kind of what I think. It's about data relationships. Today, as I said earlier, people have relationships with information, not systems. So in this case, I've got everything from my LinkedIn to my 23andMe. Does anybody know, anybody heard of 23andMe? So 23andMe is a service that you can send uh, some saliva to. They will sequence part of your DNA, and then they'll send you results, like you're probably going to die of heart disease by the time you're 50. When they send you nice information, too, like um, you're part you know, Norwegian and, and part Irish, you know, things that you need to know. But for $100, it's interesting to know because you can use the things you're probably going to get 
uh, ill with and I start to make lifestyle adjustments. But what I think is interesting about this is this concept of Zuckerberg's law. And Zuckerberg's law states that every year we share twice as much information online as we did the year before. So just in this year alone, in 2013, I've had people who didn't contact me on LinkedIn, they did not contact me on Twitter, they did not contact me on Facebook, but they friended me on Fitbit. They didn't care about where I worked, what type of cat I had, or what I ate for dinner. They wanted to know how I was sleeping. That's pretty intimate. But they didn't think like that. They just thought, ooh, I want to know information, Chris Dancy. I don't care about Chris Dancy. I want to know information, Chris Dancy. And what was even scarier was I've had two people this year that I met at conferences who didn't do anything but friend me on 23andMe. So basically, you don't care about my work history, but if I'm going to die in six weeks, you're interested, right? And that's really profound because we don't see people as organic things. And sometimes we talk about customers as if they're some tribe in Africa. We're customers. I'm a customer. You're a customer. Can we stop talking about solving customer problems and start talking about, talking about our problems? I think it's possible. The idea is something rooted in the concepts of surveillance, except in French it's pronounced surveillance. It's about using the information that you create for your own benefit. I had someone say to me recently in Denver, I need you to take those glasses off if you're going to be in the store. And I said, why? He said, well, it's, you know, we don't want you filming things. I'm like, well, you've got cameras all over the place. I mean, I don't, it's what the cameras are there for your protection. And I said, so is this, right? So surveillance is a way that we can use this information in a very profound way to not only change our own lives, I've lost 100 pounds, uh, to changing the lives of the people around us, making that data actionable. This is what I, when I dawned on this, uh, I started trying to figure out how I could capture this information. So this is my trip last year to Hawaii. I wasn't visiting Mark. Uh, he didn't invite me out. Um, but I noticed, my gosh, I had all these different data points that were happening on my way to Hawaii. I realized my trip to Hawaii wasn't a bunch of photos. It was a bunch of data points. So I went on a quest to say, well, how easy would it be to get this data into one place so that either a organization could use it or I could use it? And it turns out it's impossible. The digital exhaust that you leave behind just sitting here is profound. It is as profound as solar energy, the amount of information that's just falling off of you. And we're giving it away. If I asked you to find a restaurant that had a certain style of Mandarin food within two blocks that served after 9 PM, you could give me that information in two seconds. If I asked you to tell me what you did last week on Tuesday, you'd look at me like you were in a time machine and you'd just woken up. The internet is dead. The internet is coming online. The internet allows you to have a relationship with you, your information, and the world around you. And that's a profoundly different experience for customers, for us, for, for our families, right? It's a profoundly different baby book a mom will give to her child. This is our example of this. Uh, Instagram over on the side now allows you to have multi-API calls. As you know from the Salesforce One platform, you can do different API calls. So Instagram in some ways was humanity's first digital sonogram because you could take a regular photo and you could lay a filter on it, geotag it, and put a little bit of information on it. We literally, Instagram is so interesting because it gave us a chance to say, this is how I'm feeling. Right? And people could see it in information. All the way through um, movement throughout my city in Denver as I run around and do things before a trip. So we're creating a synchronized version of reality, although some of us just might consider it living our lives. This creates what I call existence as a platform. Everyone likes to talk about the internet of things, the internet of the customer, uh, the quantified self. But those are all just segues to the next major shift in information. We, if you're under a certain age, your job will be to build information experiences. You won't program software, you'll program dining room furniture. You won't design lighting systems, you'll design memories. When everything is programmable and everything is awake, you have an assisted adapted experience which profoundly changes your relationship to the world around you. That type of power is remarkable. 
and it will keep generations employed. But we happen to be in the trough between the completely programmable information age and the technology age. So at any given point, you've got applications, devices, sensors, and services all capturing this information, and you can use them. Today's services like Ift and Zapier allow you to go on and create custom recipes. If I move this much today, send me a text that says good job. Um, uh, the Hue lighting system, Philips was in the keynote this morning. Philips has a lighting system where you can actually take a photograph and you could say, hey photograph, this is my trip to Hawaii, match the uh, dining room light to the sunset, match the uh, living room light to the whale, and, and create just a mood in the room. Ambify takes the music you're listening to in your connected lighting system and makes them sync. And then BioBeats, which just came out two months ago, takes the music you listen to and or your activity and creates new music from it, adaptive media. So your data exhaust literally is creating new things for you. If we start using this and we harness this information, it can change a lot of our relationships that might not be as equitable as we want. For me, this happened three years ago as I realized me and Rocco both were wearing activity trackers and we were both sedentary at the same types of times and we were active at the others. When I brought my house online, I noticed there was a correlation between my house, Rocco, and me. When I started adding Wi-Fi toys in my house, I noticed they also were active and had similar data patterns. When I plugged my truck into automatic, I could then drive Rocco to the dog park and I knew that Rocco was a little bit nervous, I was a little bit nervous, and the truck even said, you're making too many fast accelerations and you're braking too hard. I drive nicer now because Rocco and I share information and the truck gives us feedback. If my father had this, I would have been a less terrorized child, right? But no, I always got, they'll make me pull the car over. You know, to this day, I can't handle that phrase, right? Because man, if that car got pulled over first in the 70s, you got that gravel, <laughs> you know? It was terrible, roads were terrible back then. Why didn't we fix that? I mean, it's, we had a chance, could have done something. All right, uh, and then even now my mattress. My mattress uh, actually has a bedit, which is great because I don't think you should have to wear devices, right? The bedit just wraps around your mattress and it measures your sleep. It's ambient technology, right? You don't have to have to wear anything, it just collects the information. So now that you've got all these things around you collecting information and sharing it, you've got this profound experience where the world is chattering around you. And that's a good thing. People don't want more devices, more applications. They don't want more software. They want a relationship with information. You want a relationship with information. We've built dashboards for decades to help guide businesses. We didn't build dashboards for us. We build them for other people. We need personal dashboards. We need personal feedback loops. We need the same type of information that scientists use for decades, if not centuries in some cases, to understand how humans behaved. Which leads us at our final crossroads. If we are heading to a future built on the raw materials of data exhaust and information, how does that change our relationship to not only ourselves, but the people around us? Does it make us more human? Does it make us less human? Do we even need to objectify the word human? Can we stop creating words that mean something? The thing that's killing technology faster than, than our relationship to it are the words we use to describe it. Words are much too powerful to wrap around technology. Words limit and speed up technology. They make technology not tangible. The English language is breaking our ability to deal with the velocity of change in which we're going through. Imperceptibles, the next stage. Dreamforce 20, Dreamforce 21. I'll be here, hopefully. Hopefully I'll be thinner. I won't age, it'll be a whole Benjamin Button thing. I'll probably be an infant crawling across the stage. But imperceptible electronics are here today. So the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation funded this last year. Basically it's a sensor for new mothers to wear and they can get a real time feedback on their baby at any given moment by looking at their phone, right? That's wonderful. Mom has a relationship from her, with her child the minute that that sensor is placed on. Now you could say the moms have a relationship, but some moms are busy. <laughs> You know, there's an app for that, right? So how would this change if you could actually understand and view this information? Or you could realize, ooh, someone just came to my house and it's not as clean as it could be and 
uh, the air is kind of nasty, I need to get out, right? So we create healthier babies. Or this, which just was announced last month. This is a flexible uh, transistor foil, which can go in any part of your body. So for the roof of your mouth, it could dynamically measure what you're eating, use smart pills then to dynamically adjust the dose of the pill you're taking. Because if you take a pill and you eat something, the pill's gonna change the way it's reacting. There's no Wi-Fi between the roof of your mouth and your gut. But there is now, right? So think about how that changes patient care. Think about how it changes how doctors look at you. You come in, you fixed yourself. Like, I don't know, I just changed some of the settings on the pill. You did what? Right? It's very, very real, and you know, it's less than six or seven years away. It's actually happening now, but I can't show you imperceptibles. Which leads us to, do we design for a future of customer interaction where customers are in control? Right? And you do, you can do that by designing the things around them to be responsive to them, not to force them into those situations. We're not at a crossroads. We're actually at the very beginning. All this time I've been using this slide and saying we're at a crossroads because it's a fun slide. But in reality, I don't think there ever was any choice or any decision. For me, this has always been about learning who I am, being kind to myself, understanding the things that make me happy. And is there a way to do that faster without hurting people along the way while respecting myself and respecting my boundaries? I'm going to close with a very simple example of how this could work. I hate having my blood drawn. Hate it, hate it, hate it. Now, it doesn't hurt. I turn away. I don't look. I'm not one of those people that can look. Those people always scare me. If you can look at that, I mean, that scares me. I mean, I'm, I'm happy. It just it freaks me out, right? But recently, I actually volunteered for a genetic test at NASA. Long story, don't ask. <laughs> what were you doing at NASA being genetically tested? Guess what? I'm not actually human. No, um, don't tweet that. Um, <laughs> But I didn't like it, because like, I'd never met the guy before, and he'd never met me, and he looked kind of nervous, and of course I was kind of nervous, and your fingertips actually do sweat, which is really interesting to notice. Um, so he's, he's pricking my finger, I'm like, oh, I hate this, you know, gosh, there's gotta be an easier way for him to get my genetic information. And then it dawned on me, 23andMe has this amazing laboratory system where you can actually use the sequencing bits that they do on your genetics and turn it into music. So we each have a unique song. So I thought, well, gosh, it wouldn't be easier if I just sent this guy a mixtape. So I went to 23andMe, I downloaded my genetic song, and I emailed the guy my song. And while he couldn't do anything with it because he didn't have the systems, he liked the idea that the information I was sharing with him was unique, it was about me, and all we were doing was Napster for genes. Would you like to hear my genes? So my genes can kill PowerPoint. <laughs> I've got some good DNA. When you are so wired you can destroy a machine at a distance, this is what it's all about. So uh, we are literally at the end of my section. We're going to get ready to turn it over to the demo here, I think. Very good. Mr. Scott is always control. Isn't Scott Beach wonderful? There we go. Let's jump right in there. So think about everything you've heard today. Think about what it would be like if you could send someone a song instead of taking their blood. If you didn't force someone through your version of a process, but you allowed them to have yours. Think about what it would be like if you could use your information for your own benefit and not give it away. But more importantly, think about the types of technology that you create as being a reflection of who you are. Because at the end of the day, the technology you use becomes you, and you become it. Hammers became shaped the way they're shaped because of how we use them. We're the creators of technology, therefore we share a symbiotic relationship with it. Make healthy tech choices. Use tech that makes you feel good about yourself. I'd like to thank everyone in the room for coming today. Salesforce.com for trusting in me to do their crazy session about how I live my very assisted life. 
my friends at BMC Software who put up with me and my crazy ideas for some time, uh, Shutterstock that actually gave me all these great images to use, my peers and mentors that are in my life who do so much to keep me going when I just don't want to share any bit more of my heart rate or my DNA. Uh, and finally, I'd like to thank myself because I am crazy. Uh, and it is hard to sit there and, and think about these things and be this kind to myself in, at the same moment. And I'm going to turn it back over to Scott, but I really do appreciate your attention because it is really the last commodity we have. Thank you. Thank you so much. That certainly is a tough act to follow, but I, I think we, we can really dial the clock back today a few years and still appreciate a lot of great things that are yet to come. Today at the keynote, Mark announced Salesforce One platform. And from my perspective, this announcement was it was less of a product announcement, although it is a product, it is a real product, but it was more of a vision and more of an idea of how we can connect people, devices, and ideas. And this, this platform, now from a service perspective, because this is the world I live in, I think about service and support every day. I think about how it can be easier for call center agents to live their lives every day. How can I enjoy picking up the phone and dealing with the customer who may not be so happy with me at that moment? So we are now building tools on the Salesforce One platform that enable you to take your life as a service professional anywhere that you go. And that's really what Salesforce One is all about. It's about building one app. It can be your app. It could be our app and deploying that app across every device that you have in your organization, phone, tablet, even Google Glass. You saw Google Glass in the keynote. That was the Salesforce One platform. And I think the broader picture of what we're doing is also important to appreciate here. I mean, this is not an app. In fact, apps become less important because we dream up new apps in real time. And on the platform, there are ways to point and click your way through building an app. So I could literally build an app in 10 minutes. That's kind of interesting. But what's more interesting to me is that all of this information is in one place. And when you bring your employees, customers, prospective customers, even the, the folks that you market to that you don't quite know yet, when you bring all that information into one place, you can really do some amazing things. And I, am, I, I can't wait for Dreamforce next year to see what all of you have done with the Salesforce One platform. Now, this didn't come for free. And in fact, there were some very, very smart people who built this. I happen to have the lead architect for the Salesforce One platform for Service Cloud with us today. Orion Shelberg is here with us, and he's going to help me uh, demonstrate case management on Salesforce One. Now, does anyone in the room have anything to do with service and support? Everyone. OK, good. I was hoping I was in the right session. I never know. So what we've done is we have, we've spent the last nine months taking what we built on the desktop and making that desktop tool, we call it case feed, because working cases, agents working cases in the feed is a very logical, chronological, federated way to handle cases. And we brought that to the mobile phone. So I'm going to switch over here. Anybody familiar with case feed? A few? OK. Well, I'm going I'm to make you a little bit more familiar with it here. What we have is Salesforce One running, and we have a, a case open. And this case, actually, the customer's name is Bob Evans. You can't see it here because I didn't put it in the header. The header is configurable, but I just didn't put that there. It's a, kind of a, a throwback to growing up in Michigan, for those of you from the Midwest. Uh, so. 
let's just take a look and see how Salesforce One for, for Service works. So at the very bottom of my feed, you'll see a feed item down there where I actually created this case on November 1st. Now, the first thing that we did was I had a chat transcript, a, a live chat conversation with Bob. And he, we were talking about something. He's having trouble with his HD video connector. But the problem is I couldn't solve his problem over live chat. And so what did I do? Next thing I did is I reached out to a colleague of mine named Lauren, because Lauren, she's, I mean, she's a technical whiz. And I was just asking her, this is a, 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 an example of case swarming. I'm asking a subject matter expert to come in here. And let's see what, what Lauren said to me. She said, OK, yeah, I, I have seen this before. I'm going to attach a knowledge article. And you'll notice that she attaches a knowledge article. Every single customer and case interaction that we have is documented in the feed. That's very important, because it's all about the journey of understanding and knowing your customer. And if you can document every single interaction that we have with both the customer and around the customer, so that metadata, that conversation I had with Lauren, tells me something about this customer. It tells me this customer is probably more technically savvy than I am. So Lauren actually attached this FAQ. And it turns out that I, I, I'm a knucklehead. I, I forgot about this thing. This, this is a simple switch. You just flip the B switch on the back. So I'm just going to give Bob a call. And how do I do that? Oh, well, it looks like I better hurry up here, because my, my SLA process is telling me that I've only got a few more minutes to do this. So we're going to use something in Salesforce One that we call the Publisher Action Tray. So that's a little plus button in the lower right-hand corner. You probably saw this for the keynote. I've set up my Publisher Tray, and you can configure yours however you like it. The first thing we're going to do is we're going to log the call that we had. So click on that uh, action there. Now you'll notice that publisher actions are smart. They're contextually aware. So it knows that I'm dealing with Bob. And it knows that I've got case 1609 in flight. So let's go ahead and, and log the call that I had with Bob. Sorry, on. It's actually the. Uh, Probably the easiest thing he's ever been asked to do. <laughs> but you're doing a great job. OK, so now I've logged the call. It's recorded the call in my case feed. And guess what? This solved the customer's problem. So Orion, let's, let's use the publisher action tray again. And let's close this case. So use the one in the upper right-hand corner there. Case closed. Wonderful. So what we've seen now is a completely mobile version of an agent's life cycle of working with a customer, getting to know a customer, doing research, and solving a case entirely on your mobile phone. Now, is that everybody's use case? If you work in a contact center, are you going to have agents running around on phones? Maybe not. Probably not. But it would be nice to have that information at your fingertips no matter where you go. Because I know I used to work for some small companies, and I was both running operations, running the call center, and sweeping the floors all at the same time. And I, it would have been nice to have those customer cases in my hand. So thanks so much, Orion. That was a great demonstration. OK, so at this point, we've left ourselves a little bit of time. I would love to open it up to questions. And please, uh, Chris, I, you know, he's, he's modest enough <laughs> that you should and you m most definitely would benefit from following him on Twitter. He's got things to say that might raise your eyebrows every now and then, but I can't stop reading it. So please follow Chris on Twitter. And do we have any questions in the audience? Yes? OK, the, the question is, she's talking about the posture app that Chris had on his, on his phone. Is this, is this a new thing? I mean, what's so um, you have to remember, there's, every day there's more and more sensors and becoming cheaper and cheaper. So uh, basically, it's a, it's a sensor called LumoBack, L-U-M-O-Back. 
And if you sit too long, it vibrates and say, hey, get up and walk around. And if you're slouching, it tells you you're slouching and it vibrates to make you sit up. There's been a lot of health studies that show that posture actually contributes to really good health. So again, it's just using my information. I'm sitting there, right? I should have access to how I'm sitting because I'm not paying attention, and that's what it's doing. Anybody else have any questions? You can really ask anything. This is kind of your offer. Yes, sir. So the question. Yeah. So. Uh, yeah. So I'm talking about little data, which is different than big data. Um, so the first question was about the posture app. Um, his question was, is there anything out there that allows you to actually harvest your own information? And there really is nothing now. I mean. There is a lot of API, I mean, Salesforce One has a lot of APIs in their platform. There's a big push right now for programmable web and creating these APIs. The fastest way to do it, and I think, you know, if people just want to practice is go to ifttt.com or Zapier, sign up, it's for free, and just say, hey, if I create something, save it somewhere. And uh, unfortunately, there is nothing right now saving your own information. It's just going out the window, like sounds exhaust. Like a, sounds like a great idea. Though, sounds like a great it? idea. Someone should build that app. Uh, any, any other questions? Little data, big data, service cloud. OK. Let's well, thank you so much for joining us today. Really appreciate it. And any other questions, please feel free to reach out to any one of us. Thank you so much.